what makes Draco Dice different from every other blockchain game? That's a fantastic question. And my answer for that is that every game that we're seeing, I, I like to categorize it as one of two types of games. Interface games, which primarily revolve around pressing buttons and then watching an outcome happen without much influence from you, the quote unquote player. And then there's what I would call real games, which are there is a constant interaction between the player and the game. It's much more dynamic. It's much more involved. It's much more the kind of thing you would expect to see on a console or on a mobile device rather than merely in a browser. Nothing against browser games and nothing against interface games. But this is a real video game that we're building to start out with. Okay. And how do you differentiate between the other games then? We're starting out with Draco Dice Skirmish, which is releasing into public beta in January of next year. That is a small part of a much larger effort. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can talk about what makes Skirmish different from the other blockchain games. But then I, I think I need to touch on the bigger picture there. So what makes Skirmish different uh, is a couple of things. One is that it's very much dedicated to allowing for a high skill ceiling. The game is about 60% luck and 40% skill. It's player versus player, it's competitive. And it's the first blockchain game that I've ever seen that allows players to put their NFTs at risk for an opportunity to take another player's NFTs. That's yeah. something that we're offering in the hardcore mode. Uh, in terms of the bigger picture, and, and to, to reframe the conversation a little bit, um, Skirmish is a, a fun-oriented use case for what makes Draco Dice themselves different from every other blockchain project. Because the vision for Draco Dice is having these digital assets that you're able to take into multiple video games across multiple blockchains. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that is that was the really big difference I noticed was, was that. Uh, what happens if it fails though? What happens if nobody else picks this stuff up from the from the dev from the dev fund that's being set up? Like what do you get? So I I've already set aside the resources to guarantee that Draco Dice will be playable in multiple games. Part of the Draco Dice roadmap that we've just established uh, that's now visible on the website as of today mm -hmm. is that by quarter four of next year, there will be a second fully integrated blockchain game that uses all of the Draco Dice that exist up to that point. Yeah. Uh, and in terms of, man, I, I asked you to be, um, adversarial and you're going for the third <laughs> what, what if what if it bombs what if it's a disaster I mean, that, and makes no is, money and nobody cares but, but that is the risk that's running because you know blockchain of course is very 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 new and especially you, know, you guys are forging a new path with with different like just and something entirely different for blockchain stuff in general right like the ability like you're going to have a common set of dice that kind of act as your own bag of dice that you can take to different games with and that's something that hasn't really been done before. And what you're describing when you say that is you're describing something that real world games players, people who play Dungeons and Dragons and other tabletop games and board games, that's a reality for them today because we're talking about physical goods when we talk about that. And the fact that that's never existed in a digital form is something that's bothered me personally. And that's, that's really the dream that you just described. Uh, so it's not going to bomb in, in the way that that question described, because we've already gotten multiple partners on board, other established games in the WAX blockchain space to begin with. Um, Colonize Mars is the first other game that's partnering with us, and we're setting up a, a way for their community to gain access to exclusive dice for participating in our sale. But beyond that, I don't see a future where we're taking this incredibly pro-consumer, pro-collector, pro-gamer position into the world and no one's interested. There's too much potential there. And I, I can see how ambitious this thing is. And I know I'm not the only person who's thinking, man, I wish I had more value attached to the items I use in video games. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's the thing that I've been having conversation with uh, around the wax organization is, you know, it'd be great if I could somehow sell these Fortnite skins I'm accruing that I don't want, right? But it, it, it's just not going to happen. Uh, but that's something where blockchain, you know, will will enable that feature. 
something that, that makes this this particular conversation between these two people so interesting is the fact of uh, what wax was born out of, right? Because it was born out of OP skins and it was born out of that goal of letting people attach real value to digital items. Is that, that began as, uh, as Counter-Strike skins, correct? Yeah, yeah. So uh, the way I see it, you know, both of the visions uh, that are that are driving my organization and that are driving WAX are very much aligned. There's a lot in common between the futures that each of our, our organizations is aiming towards. Okay. And with the... Hold on a second. Uh, with the multi-chain exchange, how does that work? And how did you choose Ethereum? Uh, Wax, and I think the other one is, is Bitcoin, right? It's a, it's a Binance Smart Chain. Binance, Binance, I'm sorry. So this is a capability that was that is being delivered to us by a utility partner that we are working with called Game Exchange. Um, they were formerly known as the Tap Project, and they just rebranded. And so the chains that this is becoming uh, enabled for that wasn't up to us. It was up to the functionality that they've already developed, and I know that they're aggressively developing towards expanding that into other chains as well. Uh, so it's not actually the Draco dice themselves that are special in that they are enabling cross-blockchain functionality, but rather that they are a, a, an immense use case for game exchanges technology to prove it out with gaming assets that people can put real utility into. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we're just getting to the point with with traditional video games where you can finally play again, you know, if you have an Xbox, you can play against somebody who's playing on PlayStation or, or Switch or PC. And it feels like this is an answer to, or getting out ahead of that problem that took what, 20 years to get beyond once we had the advent of online gaming with, with console games and PC games. Feels like this is getting out ahead of that problem pretty early. Somewhat, I, I have to clarify there because there is definitely a distinction between having assets that are happy to move between different platforms and having a game that functions uh, well between two different kinds of platforms. Because no matter what we build into Draco Dice, uh, a developer who's making a game is still going to have to do their own legwork to make sure that the game itself communicates properly between two services. Okay. Uh, we are just making it so that once their game does, or if you want to make a game that's built on Ethereum or BSC, you don't have to do any extra work to allow Draco Dice to be integrated. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And like you said, like that is, that kind of helps pay the vision off, right? In terms of these are going to be something that you can use and take in and out of any game that's going to use Dice. So to achieve that, you kind of need the, that portability to the different blockchains. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, more than that, it's not just about creating assets that are capable of moving between different blockchains, but rather that I don't like the way that blockchain has evolved to become an ocean of 10,000 isolated islands. You know, blockchains don't talk to each other very much. There's not a lot of interoperability there, but all of the smart minds out there in the blockchain space, they're looking for ways to make this whole thing more interoperable. And that's why when we saw what Game Exchange was doing, we're like, this is the way that we're going to kick this off. We're going to kick off interoperability on a practical level. It's going to be a combination of our awesome gaming assets and Game Exchange's technology. So which came first, the idea or no, or figuring out Game Exchange's technology, or did you guys meet each other at like this, you know, uh, fortuitous moment um the the dice came first um because they, they've been a passion project since day one i'm a huge collector of physical dice i've got like 800 uh back back in my home in denver uh and there's a there's a bunch more on the way because i'm like a hopeless kickstarter addict uh i, I really wanted uh, some sort of gaming NFT that I could throw my own personal love into and that would still be um, usable across multiple games. But the multiple blockchains part, that definitely came into play when we were introduced to Game Exchange, saw what they were doing, and saw the value of it. Okay. When did, all right, so when did the DICE idea come up? Uh, you said you've been working on that for a minute. What's the Yeah, we've been working on that for about five months now. Okay. Um, 
how did I decide I wanted to do dice? I don't, I actually don't remember how I came up with the idea, but I, it was, it was probably related to, to my Kickstarter addiction because, um, and I'm just throwing Kickstarter out there. Kickstarter is a really huge place for people to launch custom dice projects. They release them in all sorts of materials with all sorts of designs. I've got metal dice and glass and porcelain and uh, pure gemstone. Uh, one of my favorite sets is, is amethyst. And uh, I, I guess I, I must have at some point seen all of this collection I was building and thought, why don't we have NFTs like this? Because dice are so great for gaming. Mm -hmm. Why hasn't anyone done this? And that, that's, that's how I'm speculating this, this whole thing started. <laughs> Okay. And so that was five months ago and you guys, and you met up with the game exchange folks about when? Soon afterwards, Okay. soon afterwards. Um, there's a lot of connectivity between the people on this. Cause obviously uh, my dad, Joel Com, is the other like owner of the company that we're building this under. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, even though there's, there's a couple other people on the team, cause we've got Clark and Cameron Mitchell who are the two artists who are helping illustrate everything and, and make the videos and whatnot. Uh, but then the administrative organization that works with Bad Crypto uh, is called CCP, not to be confused with the Chinese Communist Party. <laughs> you started laughing before I said not to be confused. So you, you saw that one coming. Um, and, and they have a lot of connections and they were already connected to Game Exchange. So they, they made a match there between what we were doing and Game Exchange. Okay. And uh, what type of attention are you hoping to attract from developers with the, 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 the developers fund? Well, it's, it's really that game development is already difficult. Mm -hmm. And blockchain game development is twice as hard because of the need for, for smart contracts and for assets that people are willing to place value on. So I'm coming at this from a sort of product man's perspective, thinking, well, how can we make the lives of blockchain game developers easier? I don't know how to code, so it's not going to be through smart contracts. Oh, we can develop an existing base of assets, assets that aren't restricted to a single game, assets that don't tell the developer what to do with them, and assets which there's already a base of existing collectors who value them. Because imagine, you know, imagine you already have this collection of, of dice on blockchain, and then the news comes out that now all of your dice uh, can be used in this other game that someone else is making. Obviously, that's not going to be a negative for the value right. of your collection. Right. Yeah, that makes it automatically, it probably helps increase the player base at that point or the amount of people who are going to be interested. Yeah, so, so to be more concise in answering that question, there's really two things that other developers are getting when they decide to work with Draco Dice. Well, three things. One is our personal attention because we want to expand the use cases and the utility for the product. Two is they get blockchain integrated assets that they don't have to do any legwork to make work. And three is they get players that are automatically interested in the future of their game before they even know anything about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And why did you pick the three blockchains that you did, or is that the the chains that that uh, Game Exchange works with already? Those are the chains that Game Exchange's technology is already compatible with. Um, okay. I, I think I said this before, but just to answer that question more explicitly, I'll say it again. They're working on adding others as well. Okay. Okay. Um, what did Clark Mitchell bring to the table, or what does Clark Mitchell bring to the table? You know, man, when, when I saw that that we, we had interest from someone who has worked with Disney and Hasbro, someone whose art ha has been on boxes that I played as a kid 20 years ago, someone who's, whose art is unquestionably top-notch. I was kind of blown away. And, and I, I realized that I could no longer properly and accurately visualize what the dice were going to look like once they were done because I've never worked with someone of that caliber of visual talent before. And so there's, there's actually a, a small story here. When we were creating the wood dice, um, the wood dice were designed to be the most common. You know, wood is not a particularly exciting 
material. People have been making wood dice for thousands of years. It's nothing, nothing super new or shocking. And he comes out with this incredible Celtic inspired aesthetic on these things. And I'm like, dude, you made the most common dice too cool. How are we going to have the rest of the set compete with them? <laughs> and it, it actually brought out more, more in me personally, because I had to think of, okay, clearly the skill that we have at our disposal is beyond what I was anticipating. And we need to figure out how to bring that same level of awesomeness and ingenuity to all of the other materials. Um, so that was, that was what drove me to ask the question, how do we make plastic dice more exciting than wood dice? Because for context, plastic dice are the single most common dice on the planet. You know, it's yeah. typically this epoxy material. Um, so it's like the most vanilla thing possible, more vanilla than wood. And I thought, okay, we, we have someone who can render anything. So I'm gonna shoot for the moon. And I gave him uh, a Menger fractal. A Menger fractal is like a, a mathematical physics theoretical construct, this crazy uh, geometrical object that has these infinitely recursive patterns on it. And I said, okay, let's make dice that are inspired by this, this idea. And he pulled it off with flying colors because now we have these these amazing like two layered dice where there's there's an inner core and a layer that's hovering over the core like it's not even connected to it but it has the fractal patterns on it and then we put a nice spray paint finish on it to uh to even rich in the visuals a little bit more and I, I couldn't be more thrilled with how these things have turned out okay that's that's what clark has brought to the table okay um so many blockchain games are are pay to win and play to earn. Why go with the the luck and strategy instead of instead of making it so? Because you know, like we were talking about, you said there were the interface games and there were the other types of games. And it's like it seems like so many of those are definitely like it's like farmers world. You got to buy in with like a thousand dollar pickaxe to get in, right? Like why did why go the direction that y'all did with with Draco dice? There's, there's multiple pieces to that. Uh, one is I'm a gamer myself and I don't tend to enjoy pay to win games as much as games that are contingent on the skill that I bring to contest you know, my opponent's will. And I can't promise that we won't have games that, that are influenced by rarity and by scarcity in the future. But to kick this off, I really wanted to I, I wanted this first game to embody the fact that this is about gaming and blockchain. It's not about investment. Mm -hmm. We're interested in long-term value and delivering long-term value and doing tons of shit to make sure that people who are just flipping dice are gonna regret it. But at the same time, it's about fun. It's about a combination of fun and giving players and collectors more agency and power over the things that they pay for, which is unprecedented in today's market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and that's that is the one thing that's really nice about the play to earn space. Um, I mean, sometimes things are a little grindy when it gets to that point, but there is there is a there is a sense of ownership there. It is you just bought something and it, it's stuck on a given platform. It's oh, I own this thing and now I can do whatever I want with it. Whether that is uh, playing, you know, with different dice in different games, or if it's selling them. Exactly. And uh, that, that's, that's another piece of it is, you know, I've, I've seen all of the opportunity that players have to be rewarded just through, uh, through regular or exceptional play in gaming period. And I'm looking at that and seeing, well, each of those opportunities for a player to be rewarded with something that can apply the blockchain as well, you know, in the future. Um, and it, this isn't like, this isn't, written in stone, it's something that I really want to do because we I sort of designs Draco Dice Skirmish to be really easily modular so that we can easily expand and build upon it in the future is that I'm thinking, well, hey, daily challenges or battle passes or achievements, those are all ways, vectors by which we can reward players with exclusive NFTs. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what if you could actually get a truly owned asset for accomplishing an actual skill-based goal. Has, has that ever been done in blockchain? Because I can't even think of it. Right, right. 
Um, so you're talking about the future. Where do you see Draco Dice a year out from now? Like you said, you know, we're gonna you're gonna be launching in Q4, right? So where do you see? Well, no, 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 no. Hold on, hold on. Let me let me correct that really fast. Um, the public beta for Draco Dice Skirmish is coming yeah. out in January. Uh, we're going to have a second game released in Q4 next year. Okay. Because um, because as I said, I'm guaranteeing that there will be multiple games that they're playable in. Okay. So beta launches in January. You've got the second game that comes out in December. What does the following year from that look like? You know, you've got it the looks first like, down. Like where 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 are you going from here? It looks like building out the use case more and more. I want to continue doing first party developments because like at the root of this uh, is not just my passion about dice, but ever since I was a kid, I wanted to make video games. Um, I've just never been the programmer. I've always been an idea guy. And I've, I've got this massive journal of, of concepts that I build on every single day, uh, games that don't exist that I want to see exist. So we're going to continue developing um, in-house, but on top of that, I'm, I'm not looking a year out. I'm looking five years out when there's 10 games that Draco Dice can be played in. When other developers have hopped on board and everyone sees this vision and everyone sees how so much value can exist in a single asset that isn't restricted by a single organization, that isn't restricted to a single game and that's not restricted to a single blockchain. And I just see this huge ecosystem uh, creating this new standard for what it means to own a digital asset. Mm -hmm. Now you said, you know, potentially 10 games in five years. And based on the current thing, it sounds like there's gonna be one game from, from your company per year, and then there might be a game from another company per year. So it sounds like there are a number of things in the irons in the fire right now. On the internal side, um, how are you gonna keep up pace with that? In addition to developing the technology and everything else for this? So this is something that I have recently observed when I, something clicked in my head recently, because um, when you think about Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg, there, there are a few things that those people all share in common, things that you're not really going to see until you figure out the pattern, um, how, how each of them expresses the, the same sort of thing differently. And what I mean by that is that I realize that all of them share a very specific message of very long-term focused growth. So first off, they're planning for 20 or 10 years out. And all of them have that in common in order to reach the, the atmospheric success that they've all achieved. Two is they remain completely customer focused every single day. And that never changed. And three is that all three of those men had easily repeatable strategic frameworks for how they were going to pursue company objectives on a periodic basis. In plain English, that means having a specific plan for what the company is going to do every year in order to reach that long-term vision. And that's what I'm building right now. I can't say that that plan fully exists, but I realize it's something that we need in order to see the success that we're targeting. Okay. Um, this is gonna be the last question, uh, but let's take a step back a little bit. Let's say, turns out that NFTs completely, everybody stops caring about them. <laughs> it could happen. It really could, right? Like. We saw the advent of like 3D television that gave way to where we're at now with, with virtual reality goggles and augmented reality. Um, but there have been just as many technologies where it seemed like it was the hottest new thing and then it just, it just fell away completely and it didn't catch fire with consumers or hit a big audience. What do you do then? What if, what if, what if Draco Dice never gets beyond the small, like the niche crowd of people that are buying NFTs? And, the NFT audience never grows. Where do you see that? How do you see that affecting the company? What do you guys do? I'll answer that in two parts because first I have a pushback against the hypothetical and then I have an answer to assume oh. that the hypothetical comes true. Oh. Uh, so the first part would be even if NFTs aren't the, the standard for truly owning things in the future, you know, what, what happened with the virtual boy and the power glove and all of the stupid experiments that Nintendo put out in those, those bombs? Well, 
adjacent technology still became the standard. So what ended up actually succeeding wasn't that far away from what failed. It's possible that NFTs are a stepping stone towards something that makes even more sense and that's even more empowering. And if that's the case, I don't think that we're going to have any trouble adapting. Now, taking into account the, the more hellish um, yeah, let's say like all of a sudden, like what if it all bombs? Yeah, let's uh, say there like, are huge environmental regulations that fundamentally alter blockchain technology. Dude, and can you imagine like wax going under because of environmental regulations? It's a carbon neutral right. chain. Just the idea right. that this is but, off so much. Right, but they're like Ethereum is not carbon neutral right now. You got to wait till Ethereum 2.0 to get there. And right now, the public perception of NFTs is that they're damaging the environment for people to have animated gifts in their back pocket that they own. Of course. Uh, we have, and we're, we're gaining continually, experience in building games. And so assuming that NFTs basically get wiped off the face of the planet in, in this hypothetical scenario, we're going to continue making games and we're going to continue making them with the approach that we're trying to give more agency and control to the people who care about them. Okay. Okay. That that's pretty succinct.